Symphony by Helen Rudem. La musique violent des gouffres et choc des glaçons aux astres. Lips pressed close to warm lips, our hearts beat to the swing of the world as it rushes through space. The stars sing a loud paean of love. Vast harmonies crash in a multiform tumult. Red planets awash on the tide of infinity rock to the din as the sound surges past us. New wave forms with encrusted wave and leaps onward. We sink for a moment as downward it sweeps, with the music of whirling of bottomless gulfs. Again upward it rushes, and dimly we hear the clash of great icebergs against a star, while color transcendent in turbulent flood hurls its spray on the white flaming shores of far suns. We are tossed and upborne on the waves that are flung by the music. The rhythm, a ladder of gold for our hearts as they mount, spans eternity, guides our wild flight through this rapture of movement and sound. As we feel its sure swaying, still closer we cling. The stars are beneath us, the harmonies swell in a mad ecstasy. O oh, pulse of my life, press more closely to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cul-de-sac by Helen Rudem There flickers one small yellow flame blown by a fretful breeze that casts small shadows on the ground to dance between the trees as some uncared-for dusty shell still covers hidden deep the murmur that a child once heard so the sad houses sleep while hid within their leprous walls that strike the heart with fear move echoes of forgotten joy none but the homeless here gaunt figures haunt the narrow street and stoop to seek within for what the day's poor comfort may have dropped into a bin beneath the night's dark covering these phantoms come and go more frail unreal and mournful than the shadows that they throw like broken windows of a room where one is lying dead their eyes gaze out upon the streets the weary feet must tread for them the days are throbbing wounds hard livid wheels of light the sun has raised upon the gloom of their eternal night the city but a cavern man has tunneled into space from whose high roof the mocking stars can watch each haggard face and so they flit by aimlessly these outcasts from their kind and ever seek an outlet where no outlet is to find save where beneath a high blank wall with shaken souls they see some useless clothes a shadow left to hang upon a tree End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Nun by Helen Rudem I look into your eyes and see eternity. The past has left no shadows there, no broken hopes, no shattered dreams. Waste wreckage of the barren years cumber their depths no fevered vain desires stretching towards the future cast clouds across their radiance pure and unsullied a mirror held in god's own hand they show me the reflection of the good hour that is in which your soul doth seek its perfect consummation end of poem this recording is in the public domain song by helen rudem thine is this hour but mine the happy giving mine the surrender and the pride of loss o reckless squandering that gives uncounted treasure o lavish hour that beggars me o bliss beyond imagining shod 
with soft meekness crowned with flaming pride this hour calls to eternity vanquishes time end of poem this recording is in the public domain press notices of the first number the times literary supplement here we have a little troop of nine singers male and female they are none of them to be despised as verse writers but they have not as a body very much in common the first five of them osbert and edith sitwell nancy cunard arnold james and iris tree certainly share a mood they are on the whole doer and morose they see nothing bright in the present and no bright hopes in the future osbert sitwell has grandiose and sinister visions but in the description of them he tends to all leap himself he leaves an impression of not quite getting the effect he aims at we should accept however from this stricture puero old and night the latter a concise catalogue of darkling images from which one cannot escape dark and boding phantoms oppress the mind also of nancy cunard who has not quite so fine an ear for phrase and rhythm as mr sitwell the deepening gloom of her little group of sonnets closes with a despairing gesture in two stanzas called from the train edith sitwell we have met with before and have yielded our tribute to the pitiless strength with which she probes human suffering or fashions nightmare shapes and fancies her the mother is a truly harrowing story and Thais in heaven a shuddering piece of macabre arnold james has only three little pieces he is gloomy but one feels that one would like to hear more from him iris tree is in a passion with the world she voices certainly with eloquence a feverish desire to escape somewhere along the long road unto nothing and a dolorous morbid hopelessness which as a poetic motif arouses rather pity than admiration all this studied and determined melancholy is however broken in upon by mr e wyndham tennant with the rippling charm of home thoughts and the work of mr tennant one of the young officers of distinguished talent whom the country has lost or should we say gained in the war is enough to give a real value to this collection he and mr victor peraum are certainly the truest poets in the old sense seekers after a simple fragrant beauty in the whole company mr peraum's lady of shalott is a beautiful ecstasy a little reminiscent oddly enough of another tennysonian poem st agnes eve and his dirge a very musicianly composition mr Sucheverell sitwell has but one short piece and helen rootham the ninth contributor who is much concerned with the issues of life and death speaks her thought in well-chosen phrase yet hardly gives us enough to judge her by she gives us to close three prose poems from the french of jean arthur rimbaud the morning post some of the poetical new births are certain to arouse the wrath of the mechanic victorian critics who have not learned that poetry is not a sort of block cosmos but a living growing creature for example wheels which is an anthology of verse by a group of poets with a common confidence in the illuminated word and a common contempt for the look see of the complacent academic has aroused a little storm of obloquy precious macabre baudelarian are some of the epithets hurled at them for there is nothing which irritates the hack critic so much as the appearance of a new school of poetry engaged in quietly working out its own conception of the art in the work presented there is much achievement and more promise and we have no doubt whatever that fifty years hence the publication of wheels will be remembered as a notable event in the inner history of english literature captain osbert sitwell's babel is a triumph in the dark fantastical mode indeed it has the power of thompson's city of dreadful night and must rank as one of the half dozen finest war poems lieutenant victor peraum 
whose poetical promise we remarked upon when reviewing a little Eton verse book years ago, is also out of his apprenticeship, while both Arnold James and the late Lieutenant Wyndham Tennant, having something to say, have said it with the mystical tongue of a various sincerity. Of the women poets, Helen Rootham strikes us as the most profound and accomplished, but the highly figured verse of Edith Sitwell, The sounds seemed warring suns, a music flowed as blood, the masked lamps showed tall houses, light had gilded like despair, black windows, gaping there, is also impressive and there are striking passages in Irish Tree's long poem of illusion and disillusion. The long road unto nothing I will sing, sing on one note, monotonous and dry, of sameness, calmness, and the years that bring no more emotion than the fear to die. Wheels must be read by all who are studying the way English literature is reacting to the historic storm without, and whether they like it, or like it not, the book is certain to have more influence in the future than a thousand critical brickbats or bouquets. The Oxford Chronicle The poets who have contributed to this anthology present such identity of mood, and even imagery, that it might seem that the mood and its emotion had been agreed upon, and was therefore not spontaneous but cultivated, were it not that the common chance which has caught them as fellow victims of a world disease, is the obvious fount of each muse, and it is through deriving from water that is, alas, muddied, that the poems are akin. The old traditional loves of the poets are far to seek. This verse does not dance with joy, but shivers with fear, creaks with menace, droops with despair. It is the work, for the most part, of very young people, and it is quite unbearably old. Its revelation is the grim fact that the dead are less dead than the living, that where the war has spared, it has slain. Miss Iris Tree, in particular, who, when she will, can be the easy mistress of the haunting line, and, in her own phrase, catch fancy's fire in the running swiftness of a rhyme, concentrates instead on a fierce mood that invokes the worm that shall come at last to be my paramour, and poises herself on a single note, monotonous and dry. The anthology derives its title from this thought of Miss Nancy Cunard, whose symbolism is further elaborated in the work of Mr. Osbert Sitwell. But Mr. Sitwell is a poet with too much energy for the fantastic symbolism of paper worlds and golden bladders, pantomime and puerile. In The Beginning, The Chaos of Creation, and The End, he piles up imagery till it well-nigh baffles apprehension, while in Night and Black Mass he gathers, item by item, into a catalogue the inducings of human terror, and, making music of the evil things of night, leaves us full of that which makes one nigh to dead with fear. Miss Edith Sitwell, Though Antic Hay shows how well she can command delight, and the King of China's daughter, that she can be altogether charming, presents for preference a tale like the mother of black tragedy, or as in the lamentation from Saul, verse, like Mr. Sitwell's, of accumulated imagery. Miss Cunard, like Miss Helen Rootham, is conquered happily by her own youth, so that the mood she would induce sits upon her only like the paper cap of one of her thousand clowns. For the rest, there are Mr. Sir Cheverell Sitwell, who has moulded his medium skilfully to his picture, Mr. Victor Tate Perown, whose loosely woven little poems acquire an added clarity by their nearness to the packed line, and three poems, now familiar and prized, from Wyndham Tennant, whose mind and method, philosophy and appeal, were alike foreign to the spirit, so perturbing and provoking of this anthology. The Lancet The camps and the trenches during the past two years have produced many copies of verses having claim to notice as beautiful poetry, and Wheels, though little of its contents may have been written in the circumstances of war, has an origin similar to that of the rapidly increasing war anthology. 
It is composed, speaking for its common and essential qualities, of impressions suddenly seized and handed on by writers who are conscious of what has been suggested to themselves and who are determined to share the suggestion with others. The idea of these young poets is that the role of poetry is rather to crystallise fleeting views and aspects, to catch and fix vague and half-formed ideas, than to do any of the brave things associated in popular literature with the title of poet, to lead, to uplift, to amaze. The inspiration of these nine different writers, different in style, technique and standard of accomplishment, has been a common one. They strive to show that any impression received by one person should be communicable to others by the medium of symbolic word pictures. We recommend the book to lovers of verse. The Southport Guardian Of several new anthologies, Wheels is the most distinctive. It is not easy to find the axle, 1916, into which the several spokes of this wheel of verse fit. Indeed, personal friendship, rather than poetic kinship, would seem to have been the sole condition for admission into the anthology. So here we have songs, as diverse as the beautiful Home Thoughts in Loventi, by the late Honourable E. Wyndham Tennant, to which we have made previous reference, and Osbert Sitwell's wonderfully realistic The Beginning, showing the coming of order out of the chaos of creation, and The End, a vivid picture of slimy horror as the world slips back into the void. Between his picture of night and the rich promise of Quero Old, a romantic narrative, and twentieth-century harlequinade. There is a feeling for nature in some of the poems of Arnold James. The consciousness of youth, potentialities, its friendships, and its frustrations, are effectively expressed by Helen Rutham, while in the three prose poems from the French she shows a subtle appreciation of moods and of words. The most matured, and most perfect in feeling and in form, are the songs of Iris Tree, especially the If I Were God. With concentrated agony, she sings of the dullard masses, the last four stanzas of the poem expressing all the disillusion and disappointment of youth with an almost morbid intensity. Poetry, a magazine of verse. This book presents itself in a pleasingly satiric cover, bright yellow, displaying a scraggy nursemaid and a makeshift perambulator. It is the proper sort of inkpot to hurl itself in the face of senile pomposity. Here, however, the gaiety ends, and the contents of the book have none of the lightness of Miss Sitwell's earlier couplet. With children, our primeval curse, we overrun the universe. Of the nine contributors, Wyndham Tennant has already been claimed by the war. One cannot read his Home Thoughts in Loventi, without being convinced that his loss is a loss to poetry, as well as to those who knew him. It strikes me that real artists, who have been plunged into the present inferno, have written simply and without rhetoric, without any glorification of war. The poem is written with prose simplicity. With the possible exception of battle-wending, there is no over-decorative word. These properties are of more importance than the very much overemphasized present question of free and regular verse. Most of the anthology is in older forms. Miss Cunard shows, at times, surprising closeness of thought and a talent for epithets with her dwarves with slyly pointed steps and her aged abstractions, love, joy, sin, in solemn, stage-learnt ecstasy. She uses the sonnet, like most poets, at the beginning of their course, without recognising that the sonnet is a peculiar costume. Like duck trousers or a scarlet hunting coat, it is suitable on some occasions, and not quite fitting on others. Few forms, say the classic quantitative measures, are a better drill ground for one's early effort, but a sense of form is not shown by trying to fit matter, which is not a sonnet, into essentially a sonnet shell. Miss Cunard manages best in the sonnet Uneasiness. Both Sir Cheverell and Edith Sitwell show promise, the latter using alternate ten and six-syllable lines with excellent rhythmic and tonal effect, 
but with an inexcusable carelessness as to meaning and to the fitness of expression. The anthology closes with some excellent prose translations from Rimbaud by H. Rutham. We would welcome a complete translation in the same manner. E. P. Editor's Note we are in a special board with male stupidity. From The Condolence by Ezra Pound Mr. Gossip, The Daily Sketch But will it be poetry, I wonder? Some Opinions The Weekly Dispatch The contents of Wheels, an anthology of verse, suggests that a band of very young and cultured amateurs have conspired together to write poetry. The conspiracy has failed, despite a good deal of dark and sinister language. For instance, one of the conspirators, Osbert Sitwell, has seen the world's doom proclaimed by an evil lichen that is like blood dried brown upon a dead man's face. He has also heard the nauseous flapping of night's bat-like wings, and knows the feeling when, like scaly snakes, the hymn to evil writhes through the subconscious basis of our mind. Some experience. Pull down the sun and burn the fiery moon, cries another of the conspirators, Edith Sitwell, in frank defiance of lunar theories. Later on, when we find that, chafing under the licensing restrictions of the universe, the deserts cry unto the moon for rain, we realise that some new planet has swum into our ken. Victor Perown knows a place where may be heard the roar of the world rushing down the want ways of the stars, and Helen Rutham modestly admits she is young enough to seize each passing hour and fling it gaily where its fellows lie. Iris Tree, the daughter of Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree, considers there are songs enough of love, of joy, of grief, so she sings contemptuously, The dullard masses that no god can save, If I were god, to rise and strike you down, And break your churches in an angry wave, And make a furious bonfire of your town. Other results of the deification of Iris Tree would be, Passion high pedestaled, pangs turned to treasure, Perfected and undone and built afresh, With concentrated agony and pleasure, if I were God, and not an ounce of flesh. Iris Tree's lurid part in the conspiracy also includes a vision of the evening dipped knee-deep in blood, and a kiss for mouth of the dust, corruption absolute, worm that shall come at last to be my paramour. To Nancy Cunard, daughter of Sir Bush and Lady Cunard, belongs the honour of having given the abortive plot the name which will identify it to literary posterity. She sometimes thinks that all our thoughts are wheels rolling for ever through the painted world, moved by the cunning of a thousand clowns. This is not, as might be thought at first, a nasty dig at publishers, but merely a poetic fancy of the author, the strength of whose imagination may be judged from the sonnet in which she hears armies of corpses hid behind the wall that creep and grind, and tear each other's souls. One feels that a poem containing Cunard lines like these deserves a stronger title than uneasiness. Nancy Cunard's boldest conspiratorial stroke, however, is the eight lines headed From the Train. Smokestacks, coal stacks, haystacks, slack, colourless, scentless, pointless, dull. Railways, highways, roadways, Black, Grantham, Birmingham, Leeds and Hull. Steamers, passengers, convoys, trains, Merchandise travelling over the sea, Smut-filled streets and factory lanes, What can these ever mean to me? The answer, of course, Judging from the form in which the thesis is presented, Is nothing. By the way, the price of the entertainment is half a crown, including tax. Second Thoughts Wheels, that remarkable anthology of verse containing contributions by Nancy Cunard and Iris Tree, which was reviewed in this column some time ago, now appears in a second edition, soberly garbed in black, 
instead of the eccentric yellow cover of the first issue. Few books of recent verse have inspired so many interesting criticisms, and the authors and publisher have added to the entertaining nature of the volume by reprinting, as an appendix, the critical squawks and grunts that the first appearance of Wheels evoked. The weekly dispatch comment is honoured by quotation in full, and one cannot but admire the sporting spirit of the poets who admit all criticism, favourable or otherwise, as a natural corollary of their poetic endeavours. Meanwhile, a fine ironic preface, in blank verse, belabours anew those critics who condemned the book on the ground of bad taste. Mr. Blackwell, the publisher, tells me that he intends to make Wheels an annual production like his Oxford Poetry Series. Published round about Christmas time, it should make an excellent shocker for bachelor aunts and spinster uncles. The Aberdeen Journal An unsatisfying volume. That there is, in evidence, considerable poetic ability, we willingly confess, but the ability is uncurbed in its choice of subject, and its imagination is unwholesome. The New Statesman It is rather stupid to put a picture of a nursemaid wheeling a perambulator with a baby in it on the cover. None of the contributors can be quite so young as that. Country Life Most of them show their youth by taking a most sad and dismal view of this dim spot which men call Earth. One laughs. The Lancet Wheels has no medical aspects whatever. The Pall Mall Gazette. The fetidness of the whole clings to the nostrils. The Literary World. Mr. Osbert and Miss Edith Sitwell, we can imagine as anxiously asking themselves, what can we do to be original? The Commonwealth. A readable volume of thoughtful poems by sensible people who are able to write melodious verse and present poetic images while they philosophise about many things. There is not a dull page, and scarcely one which does not, incidentally, picture some charming rural scene, as it ponders upon the mysteries, joys, and pains of life. The Athenaeum. Several of the contributors have produced some good work. Every Man. The names of the poets are unfamiliar to us. The Observer. The names speak for themselves. The Sketch. Their names are sufficient to ensure a second edition. The World. The verses are of varying quality. Miss Nancy Cunard is a member of a group of smart society girls. The Observer. The war impulse towards poetry has affected the young intellectuals of society as well as found poets in plainer places. We see a reflection of this in a volume of original verse which Mr. Blackwell announces. Of the fourth volume, all needing to be said is that Captain Bairn's father writes as well as illustrates it. Bullets and Billets P.S. The most interesting volumes of verse, if not the best, are at present being issued by Mr. Blackwell. The Weekly Dispatch End of Press Notices Bibliography Wheels, first volume, 1916, published by B. H. Blackwell Conceived in morbid eccentricity and executed in fierce, factitious gloom. Paul Mall Gazette We have no doubt whatever that, fifty years hence, the publication of Wheels will be remembered as a notable event in the inner history of English literature. Morning Post Aldous Huxley, The Burning Wheel Published by B. H. Blackwell Without any doubt, an original poet. The Nation Edith Sitwell, The Mother and Other Poems Published by B. H. Blackwell In all these poems, one thing is clear. They come from within. Miss Sitwell does not describe. She lives in her verse. This very little, therefore, points a long way. The Times. 
Edith and Osbert Sitwell, 20th Century Harlequinade, published by B. H. Blackwell. Every pretty woman carries a vanity bag into which she puts all her most cherished possessions, from a passionate letter from Flanders to a dinky little pink stick of lip salve. When writers of verses are happy enough to collar publishers, they put all the most precious possessions of their hearts into their books, which are vanity bags. This vanity bag is not so pretty. The New Witness E. Wyndham Tennant Warple Flit and Other Poems Published by B. H. Blackwell Mr. Tennant has an unclouded vision and a blessed gift of direct speech. The Glasgow Herald Iris Tree Poems Privately Printed Sherard Vines the Two Worlds, published by B. H. Blackwell, an extremely vivid and charming poet, The Nation. End of Bibliography End of Wheels, The Second Cycle Recording by Newgate Novelist, Algie Pug, Eva Davis and Nemo